Uh, it's go time. Time to be the story. What's up, y'all? It's your boy Lonnie. I'm sitting in here right now full of thoughts, full of things that I want to share about my life to those who are interested. You know, this is a wicked jump shot. The life of prime. And it's a, it's a, it's a long ride. It's a very, very long ride. You know, a lot of my friends know a lot of things about me. A lot of them don't. Um, everything, you know, at some point in time in my life, I didn't care about sharing. You know, you, it's, you don't go and just broadcast your, your life to anybody. You know, you just don't go to somebody and be like, hey, yo, guess what happened to me? Or this happened or that happened. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I feel like now I want to share. And it's, this is the perfect platform for, it, you know, social media. Because the field that I'm in now, you know, I have a youth basketball organization. I deal with kids in every every day. I deal with the parents as much as I deal with the kids. And they need to understand and know where my passion comes from. They can see it, you know, but I don't think they really understand it. But, you know, this is a time and a place for me to share. And I think it's going to help the kids more than anybody because the route that I took, people really, really, really don't know. They don't understand it. Like, I didn't have a straight line to nowhere. I had to go all the way around, all the way around, and still not finish with the outcome that I wanted, but it's the outcome that God wanted for me, you know? And I think that everything that I've been through, the struggles, you know, the hard times, the great times, the good times, all of it prepared me today so that I can share to the kids and people that I encounter now, all right? So this is a wicked jump shot, the life of prime. And the reason why I say a wicked jump shot is because, you know, in Biggie, Biggie verse, Christopher Wallace, RIP, you know, his lyric, he said, either you sling and crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot. And I'm an 80s baby, you know? I was born in the 70s. I'm 44 years old. Yes, I am, 44. I'm proud to be 44. Thank God I made it this far. But I was, I was born in that Ronald Reagan era when drugs was heavy, you know, a lot of young kids had money, and that's all it was. It was either you were slinging crack rock or you had a wicked jump shot. And I had the best, I'm not going to say that it was the best, but at that time, what we thought, it was the best of both worlds. I was on both sides of the fence. So that's where the name of wicked jump shot came from. And to begin, and it started off with, it's just, you know, I'm going to talk about my story from the beginning. I'm from Washington, D.C., born and raised. I grew up in Southeast Congress Park, you know. It's, it's a small little town that we used to call the belly of the beast. It's to cross a bridge from everywhere else in D.C. You know, there's no way, no way to get there because you got to cross the Anacostia River to get to Southeast. So there's no way getting around it. So you have to cross a bridge to come over to Southeast where I live at and where I grew up at. And you, you can take the Beltway and come through Suitland Parkway, but it's not too many ways that you can get to my hood. And even if you came to my hood, Savannah Street, Congress Street are two streets that go straight down, one way in and one way out. So a lot of people didn't come in my hood. And um, growing up in that hood, you know, it was rough. It was rough, you know, being shot at, being around people shooting who don't care that you're out there. Um, drugs was heavy. You know, we, we had a lot of stories that you hear in D.C. about this killer and that killer and everything was from my neighborhood. That's nothing to be proud of. But at that time, when we were young, that was what it was all about, you know. And by me playing basketball, you know, I had, uh, I was treated different. I was treated different. I had a, I had a green card to go anywhere in D.C. When I, got to, when I got to that point, you know. But growing up when I was young, Nobody cared about that. We played ball every day. We played football. Football was our sport. We played with number 11 boys club. You know, I played quarterback. I played running back. You know, pretty good at it. You know, and that was the, the, the best time of my life, though. I can remember still today. The boys club, number 11 boys club, was the best time of my life as far as sports was concerned. And um, that just taught me some lessons that I really didn't know I was preparing, 
you know, preparing me for life. And I didn't know it. You know, the discipline. You know, we had my first coach was Fat Joe, RIP. He used to make us practice on Sundays and without a ball. You know, he, he crushed us. He had us doing push-ups. He had us doing six inches. He had us running. And he was killing us. And we hated it. But we went to practice every Sunday. We never missed a day. And it was because we were so hungry to get out of our neighborhood and to do something different. Because the older guys in our neighborhood, they are different from the older guys today. It could go either way. We could even say the youngest was different. But the things that they were doing, they wouldn't let us indulge. We saw them fight every day, blood, everything. We saw them shooting every day, all that stuff. But they would be like, little young, get, get from around here. Get from over here. You know you ain't got no business being over here. They wouldn't allow us to indulge. They wouldn't allow us to do what they were doing because we were too young. So the boys club was our outlet and the recreation center. You know, my first recreation coach name was Swan. And um, he taught me a lot of things too, but I didn't know what he was preparing me for. So, um, you know, during those years, you know, that's when the sports thing was being embedded in my blood. You know, it was being given to me. I was being given the game. We had these old heads that was teaching us the game. We were receptive to it because we respected them. We weren't like young guys are today, you know. It's not a lot of guidance out here now, and they don't listen to a lot of people if they're not fresh, if they're not fly, you know, if, they don't, if they're not trendy. They don't listen to them. And that's probably one of the biggest differences today of our kids. That's not the way we grew up. You know, we had those role models. Even though they weren't positive all the time because they sold drugs, we saw them shooting and everything like that. But they taught us how not to be like them when we were really, really young. When we got older to the teenagers, it was different. You know, it was choice at that time. It was choice at that time. And... You know, a lot of my friends jumped in the game. You know, a lot of them jumped in the game. They started hustling. They started beefing and shooting and everything. And yeah, but doing all that stuff, me, I used to go on the basketball court. I was a, I was a football player. I was a quarterback, running back. We went undefeated from the age of eight years old all the way till I got to high school. Not undefeated, but we won the championship every single year. We lost one year. That's it. From eight years old to 14 years old, I lost one championship. Won a championship every year. So I was a born winner. But when all this stuff was going on, I used to be on the basketball court, sun up to sundown. Never played on a team. My friends out to football practice, they would go basketball practice at number 11. I never played basketball for number 11. I, I wasn't playing basketball at all on a team. I was just going on the basketball court, just shooting. And it started in my house when I used to have hangers. I have hangers like this big, really this size. And I would twist them, make basketball courts, and I would hook it over my door some kind of way. And got to a point I would even take tape and twist it over the, the edges and make a rim and make nets. Then I would take another one and put it on the other side of the house on the wall and destroy my mother wall. Like the tape, when they take the tape off and peel the paint off the wall and everything. But I made a full court in my house and I would make the ball out of a piece of paper and I would wrap tape around it. And that was my basketball. So I would be in the house and at that time, the Sixers, because of Dr. J, was the only team on TV. And the Lakers with Magic Johnson. Those were the only two teams that I saw on TV. I honestly really didn't see Boston except for they played the Lakers. But living in D.C., the Lakers and, ball, and, and the Sixers, I mean, were the only two teams that really played on TV. So I knew every player that played with both teams. I actually kind of liked the Sixers more than I did the Lakers because I love Magic Johnson, who was my favorite player. And for the Sixers, I knew Dr. J. I knew Bobby Jones. You know, I just knew Mo Cheeks, um, Andrew Tony. I knew all these guys. So what I would do was I'd be in the house playing full court with this little ball on these rims I made, and I would call everybody name out. Ooh, Magic throws the worthy. Worthy throws to Byron Scott. Byron Scott, shoot, oh, block shot. Andrew Tony, he kicks it up to Mo Cheeks. Mo Cheeks to Bobby Jones for three. 
And I fell in love with the three-point line because during that time when three-point shot first started coming out. But, you know, that was me playing ball and developing an IQ for basketball and had no, no idea of what I was doing. No idea. But that's when I first fell in love with the game. And my uncle bought me an Iceman poster. The old school poster when he was sitting on the blocks of ice with the silver sweatsuit, white silver Nikes on, legs crossed. He bought me that poster and I had that poster in my house along with Eric Dickinson. Eric Dickinson was my favorite player. Los Angeles Rams back then, Eric Dickinson was my favorite player. So that's the whole you know basketball thing from that point in my life. But in my neighborhood, it was so competitive. I had guys in my neighborhood that were better than me, bigger than me, stronger than me, you know, even some that were smaller than me, better than me. They played ball longer than me. They were older than me. And all of us know when you're young, the old guys don't let you get on the court if you ain't ready. You got to be really special to get on that court. So I used to always get this orange, same basketball every Christmas, rubber orange basketball every Christmas I used to get. And um, I go on the court, shooting around after school, you know, getting my shots up. Cause I loved it. I just loved to shoot. That was my thing. I loved to shoot. And the older guys get down there at six o'clock after they get off work or wherever they coming from. They come at six o'clock. Malcolm X playground. That was the spot in Southeast. That was the popping spot. Everybody from Southeast came there. No matter what neighborhood you lived in, if you hoop, you got a pass to come around there. If you ain't hoop, you couldn't come around there. You couldn't come to Congress Park if you ain't play basketball coming on that court. All right. And the only way you can come on that court if you hustle. If you was a street dude, as if you were betting against dudes from our neighborhood and y'all were cool with that. That's the only time you can come around there. But if you was a, just a hooper and a dude who had a job or you was in school or something like that, you can come and play ball. So at 6 o'clock every evening, everybody come around there. My guy in my neighborhood, Melvin King. <laughs> Melvin was probably one of the best athletes in our neighborhood. He always be first. He come up there, take my ball. I had to sit on the sidelines and watch these guys hoop. They wouldn't even let me play. <laughs> and I just had to sit there frustrated and everything. But watching them made me hungry. I wanted to play with them so, so, so bad. So I had to sit there. They take my ball. I had to watch them play. Then when they finish with the ball and they ready to leave, then they give my ball back. They're gone. I don't have nobody to play with. So then a lot of the younger kids will come up there after that, and they would start playing. And these are kids that were younger than me, like little, little kids. So I would play one against 10, just me against 10 kids. I'd be out there dribbling through all of them. And in my mind, I'm thinking back to my house, to the TV, to the Sixers, to the Lakers, and the stuff that I saw. And I would try all that stuff by myself. So I was one team playing against all these kids full court. And what I didn't know then was that that was developing my ball handling skills. That was developing my IQ, being able to see the court, know the court, see what everybody's doing. And I had no clue of that, no clue. But that's what I love to do. Even when those kids leave, I'd be on the court still shooting. My mom's work late, so every day, same time, about 10 o'clock, she come riding past, or actually she wasn't working. My mother is um, a pastor. She's faith-based, wholeheartedly does her life, the way she lived. So she probably was coming from Bible study or somebody else's church or whatever, but it was always like around 10 o'clock at night. And at this time, I, of course, didn't even have lights on them. So I'd be out there shooting around and mom's come. Lonnie. <laughs> Everybody knew her voice. That's always, they hear that. Lonnie. I get my ball, boom, go home. And next thing you know, this Jones start coming in my blood and my bones for basketball that on Sunday mornings, everybody play at 8 o'clock in the morning. I would go get up early in the morning, knowing I had to go to church. I would get up in the morning, go on the court, go get my hoop on, and have my clothes in my mother's car. So when she drive past on the way to church, she'll come and get me so I can go to church. We used to have to go to church, be to church at like 10. So I only really had an hour to play. But this is after the older dudes start allowing me to play with them because it was only the older dudes playing at that time. And I got my opportunity, like one of those six o'clock evenings when they needed a player and they had picked me up. But they stayed on me though. They did not let me be comfortable. 
they would be like, yo, you play too much. You're doing this too much. So somebody come and take a spot. And I was like, yo, what did I do wrong? But all that Magic Johnson and fancy stuff that I was seeing on TV, I was mimicking, and they didn't like that. They were, these guys were fundamentally sound. They were basic basketball players. They understood how to play the game. All of them played on a high level. All of them played in high school. A lot of them didn't go to college, could have went to college, but that's during that time, it was about your money. And you learned that early. So as a teenager growing up, you was like the head of your house financially because the jobs that your parents had, they couldn't afford to have a lifestyle that was offered to the street, by the streets. So when I finally got my chance to get on the court, you know, they were on me. First thing I could do, I could shoot. I had a jump shot out the gate. They took that away. They didn't start picking me up. They had to steal a ball or whatever, and it forced me to learn how to dribble. So when I go back outside at night with the young kids, I'd be out there playing with them, handling and doing stuff, and it worked. So when I started playing with the old guys, I had handle now. I had handle and I can shoot. So inch by inch, my game just started developing, started developing. But then as I got older, the issue came when I got to middle school. When I was in middle school, um, I went to Johnson Junior High School. That's in Southeast, that's in Garfield, off 15 place. It's right up the block from where I lived at. Garfield and my neighborhood were cool. You know, they, they were all cool. They was, we was, I mean, that's the only middle school in our neighborhood, so everybody was cool. Yeah, we fought some guys from that neighborhood sometimes, all the time. Like myself, when I was going to Johnson, every day, <laughs> it's so crazy, every day on my way home from school, there was a dude that went to Johnson. I mean, with the Malcolm X, he was in elementary school. He should have been in middle school, but he was in elementary school. Every day when I came home from Johnson, I lived in Congress Park where Malcolm X is. He lived in, on 15 Place where Johnson is. So we would cross on this one little block every single day. And this dude would fight me. He was my size. He was my height, everything. And my age. actually, he's older than me. But he stayed back a couple of times. His name Juggy. Everybody know Juggy. <laughs> Juggy used to fight me all the time. Crazy. But that's what he did. He was kind of like a little bully to some guys and everything. But... He just always wanted to fight me. And the bad part about it, like, we'll see each other in different places and be cool and everything. But some, for some reason, after school, every day, this dude wanted to fight me. So we had, I had to deal with that stuff. But the school, Mr. Garner, he was the coach. He had his team already. And he really ain't had trials. He ain't let nobody play, no matter how good you were or not. So my seventh grade year, it was junior high. We didn't call it middle school. It was junior high school. It didn't start in the sixth grade like it do now. It was seventh, eighth, and ninth. So when I was there at the school, he had his team already. He had Mo Brown, guy from 15th place. He had KO, that's Chris. Everybody know Chris. One of my toughest competitors ever. One of the guys who was responsible for me developing as a player, you know, from Southeast. My, uh, my guy, Lil Boo, I mean Boo, John Bivens, Wim Brooks. Those dudes were truly three of the guys that, really, really helped me and made me develop as a player because they didn't have no cut cards. This outside of the old heads, but these guys was my age group. Kenny Washington, um, Antoine, like these guys came at me every single day. This was like the most tough competition I've ever had, period. But uh, Chris and Mo Brown, they both played for Johnson. They was Johnson's backcourt. And they were tough. They, they flat out can play. I mean, I wasn't better than either one of them at that time. They, they flat out can play. But I, I had my skills because I could shoot, and I, I developed handle, and I was tall. So one day at school, you know, they already had a team. The team had a, a game that evening. Uh, junior high school games would be like 3 p.m. right after school, 3.15, 3.30 or whatever, right after school. So this time it snowed. We had real, real bad snow. And since the, t the game was a forfeit and we were snowed in, the coach was like, hey, we're going to play a game, the school team versus the students. So they picked students out of the crowd, and I was one of the students that they picked. And I let them have it. I let them flat out have it. Like, we was playing as a school team. I gave them the business. And the funny thing is, RIP, my man Mo passed away. He wanted to fight me after the game was over with. <laughs> and it was so crazy because my, my cousin... Her boyfriend at that time was from 15 place too. 
um, Ernie. You know, Ernie was, you know, well known in 15th place. You know, he was a respected guy. He was one of the OGs over there. So he squashed that and didn't let that happen. He let them know that, you know, no, young and good, you know, chill. So, you know, I got through that because Mo was like one of the, the dudes on 15th place. You know, the, the guys who ran 15th place, he was like their little young boy. So, you know, Mo wanted to fight me. So the whole 15th place is going to back Mo. So Ernie squashed that. That I was good with 15th place, you know. And then Mo came around our way too and hooped and everything. So everything was cool and everything was good. But that was the first time in school where I played against the team and I earned my chance to be on the team. So they were in the ninth grade. They older than me. And, um, you know, they graduated. So then the next year came to play ball. I didn't make the team. And not because I wasn't good enough, because I jumped into that life to be a knucklehead. You know, my mother ain't had no clue that I was playing hooky on school. You know, I jumped in the drug game, started hustling. Um, I had one of my friends from California that moved in our neighborhood. He had a jerry curl to hold now, looked straight like Easy e This fool came and didn't even want no money. All he wanted to do was hustle and go to the mall. He just wanted to go shopping and buy tapes. He put me on Dana Dane. He from the West Coast. <laughs> I didn't even know who Dana Dane was. This fool put me up on Dana Dane. So that was my guy. And once I got in the game, it was over. It was curtains. Like, it, it flew past my head faster than I could even deal with. I had another friend from New York that came down. And uh, I met him randomly on the street. You know, he just took to me. He liked me and everything. I was like his little young boy. He used to give me money all the time and everything like that. And then he was like, hey, if I give you this, go ahead and make yourself some money. And, you know, if you need some more, I get, you know, come back. So I had a suite because my little Cali friend ain't want no money. So I gave him the whole thing. He sold it, the whole nine, and gave me all the money back. He just wanted to go to the mall and get clothes and some cassette tapes. So I had him outside hustling with earphones on. He had earphones, his little cassette thing, listening to his music, and he was just serving everybody. And I'm just sitting on the little hill on our stoop where we hung out at during school time and just getting money. So I wasn't even going to school. So after a while, it got serious because the New York guy saw how I was pumping and, you know, getting rid of everything. And then he gave me something large. He gave me, like, <laughs> something that I had no business having. And I took it. And my guy, he went to work on that. But the New York guy got in some trouble. At that time, we had um, DC's Most Wanted and it was America's Most Wanted. He was on both of those. He was on both of those for killing. Allegedly, I, was, I don't know, but he was on DC's Most Wanted and America's Most Wanted for killing somebody in our neighborhood and some other killings supposedly in New York and everything. So he was gone, he disappeared. So yet now I got all this, my guy pumping it, I get all this money back and I'm trying to figure out that, like how I'm going to take this in the house, how I'm going to have this in the house without my mother knowing because I already had the highest respect for my mom's. You know, I really didn't need to do that because I had family that backed me and did everything for me. And then even other guys in the neighborhood, since I started playing ball, would give me anything I wanted anyway. But this was a gift. This was something given to me. So I took that, got that money. He was gone. And I was like, shoot, he ain't coming back. I don't have to pay him nothing. So one day I was in the house chilling. I was watching uh, some tapes. Like um, some some videotapes, you know, I used to record all the uh, music videos, the basketball games, college games that I used to love, you know. I used to like Danny Manning, Baskerville Holmes, Sean Elliott, you know, those, those are my guys. Like, I always like tall people who can handle the ball. And then um, my uncle came to the house one day 
He walked in, and my my room was right across from my mother's room. He walked in, my door was open. He walked in, he looked in my room at me real angry. And that's not my uncle. And then he went to my mother's room and closed the door. I was talking to my mother. So he come out, they come out the room together. They both walk in my room and was like, how long you been hustling? I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, how long you been hustling? Because what I heard that you had, there's no way in the world you just started with that amount. I was like, what are you talking about? So, you know, I don't want to admit to it. I'm just playing. I'm like, what you talking about? And randomly, he was outside like the ice cream truck. And some guys were talking. And they were saying like, yo, so-and-so back in town, he looking for L. Like, he talking about he going to get L because, you know, L owe him money, this, that, and the other, blah, 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 whatever. And my uncle overheard it. So he came in the house and told my mother. He knew exactly how much he gave me everything because the guys was talking about it and boom that right there just changed my whole life shut me down completely i feel so bad because i hurt my mom's i feel so bad and for like a couple of months in the house the vibe was just different you know the conversations wasn't the same wasn't a lot of communication you know i was sad she was hurt and that made me want to do better it made me want to do a whole lot better but that was the day that everything turned around, you know. But it's other instances that happened in between that time, after that time and everything. But when I hurt my mom's, that changed me, period. Because that really was the second time that she bailed me out. The first time she didn't even know that, um, you know, the police came one time around our neighborhood. I was outside and they jumped out and they laid all that's on the ground. So I don't know if they was calling back up or if they were just over there talking just to have us in the middle of the street. It was like we was in one street, the same street that I mentioned, that's one way in and one way out. They got like eight of us lined up in the middle of the street on our stomachs, hands behind our back, no handcuffs. The bus sitting right there, stopping, traffic stopping, and the police just got their cars and just chilling. And we just laying on the ground. So somebody called my mother and she came around there and um, she was like, why y'all got my son on this ground? Y'all need to be worrying about these other guys around here and da 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 My son not out here doing nothing and da and whatever. And she walked to me and grabbed me off the ground. And I think her passion and her sincerity about it, the cops let her do it. And she picked me up and took me and we walked off in the house. She was like, I told you to stop hanging on this street. You know what they're doing over here and everything. But at that time, I was doing more than everybody. And she actually saved me and bailed me out. That one situation could have changed everything in my life. That one little situation. And at that time, that's when they call crack a black drug. Because if you get caught with powder, cocaine or whatever, that's a white drug. And the sentence is way less than what you would get for a crack cocaine. So that little thing right there could have made me a felon. It could have put me in jail for a long time. And I wouldn't be right here now being able to tell my story. You know, but that everything that I do today is because of her, her faith, her trust, her belief, her belief in God. Like I hurt her and that hurt me even more than anything in my life. And it forced me to change. It forced me. It forced me to do right. You know, by her grace, her prayers, you know, that made me who I am today. And that's why I'm here now being able to tell this story.